We love to talk, don't we? Talk, talk, talk. It's political talk, it's sports talk, it's news talk, it's family talk. It's a lot of talk in our generation. Not only are we talking in what we say, but what we send online, social media, a lot of words being spent. In fact, one fifth of your life on earth is spent talking. And that doesn't include the amount of time we spend talking to ourselves. And we do talk to ourselves. Uh, in one year, if your average rate of speed is typical, and for men that's about 20,000 20, words a day, for women that's about 30,000 words a day with gust up to 50,000. <laughs> but if you speak at an average rate of words per day, uh, you will fill up 66 books of 800 pages each in one year. You didn't know you were saying that much, writing that much. Maybe you wouldn't want the story to be told as to what you're writing with your words every day. But it's true, words matter. And today I'm talking about the awesome power of the spoken word from James. And the title of the message is Taming uh, the tongue. Now, some people have just a natural gift at communicating. Some people are introverted. You don't say too much. Others are extroverted. And we say a lot. I obviously spend a lot of time talking. Uh, when I was in grade school, when they were marking my citizenship, I would often get, often get marked down for talking in class, just talking whenever. And, uh, but maybe you're a talker, maybe you're not. I did hear about um, a, a young man who went to work at a grocery store. And he was an exciting young man. I mean, he had a lot of ability, a lot of charisma. And he was working at the back uh, of the produce area one day and a little lady walks in at the end of the day, just before shut off closing time was there. And he, he, she said, young man, young man said, I need a half a head of lettuce. He said, well, ma'am, I don't even know if we sell a half a head of lettuce, but I'll find out. So he walks an aisle or two over and finds the manager of the store and says, sir, I know it's closing time. I hate to ask you this, but there is a crazy dingbat of a little old lady who walked in here and wants a half a head of lettuce. And he turned around and saw that the little lady had followed him back there. <laughs> but quick as a flash, he said, but we're in luck because this fine little lady wants the other half. So they took the lettuce, they cut it in half, they wrapped it up, they put it in a sack and uh, she went on happy as she could be and the manager was really impressed. Said, son, I saw what happened. How you just stuck your foot right in your mouth and extracted it with such expertise, that was amazing. He said, uh, you're not from around here, are you? He said, no, sir. He said, where are you from? He said, I'm from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Said, oh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, I've heard of it. He said, yeah, you know, we're famous for two things in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Really, what, what are you famous for in Lancaster, Pennsylvania? He said, well, for one, our hockey teams. We got the meanest, roughest, toughest, greatest hockey teams on the planet in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Said, well, that's great. Said, what's the other thing? He said, well, we don't like to talk about it that much, but in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, we're known for our ugly women. I don't know if it's the cold, the temperature, what it is, but the ugliest women on earth are from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Store manager said, really? My wife's from Lancaster, <laughs> Pennsylvania. And quick as a flash, the young man said, oh really, what team does she play for? <laughs> now some people just got it when it comes to talking. Sometimes though, we get penalized for mouth in motion, right? And in fact, the tongue is a kind of muscle, it's a membrane in your body that gets more exercise than any other muscle you have. Medically, it's just a few ounces of sl a slab of mucous membrane, but the nerves, the bundle of nerves around us enable, uh, it enable us to chew and, and to taste and, and to swallow food and of course to articulate words with our tongues. 
part of the creative power of God. We are made in the image of God and God who speaks, breathes life into us and, and words into us and enabled us with words to communicate with him and, and with one another. It's a great gift from God. When you go to the doctor, if you're sick, if you're doing a physical, often the doctor will ask you to open your mouth and stick out your tongue. Put that little stick down there till you gag nearly. Look down in your throat, look at your tongue. I never know exactly what they're looking for. But I do know that it has something to do with my health. And your tongue tells us, uh, 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 all of us, a lot about our spiritual health. About how we're doing spiritually. Especially the matters of the heart. Because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, and I'll post these on the, the screen for you, verses 10 and 11, and he called the people to him and said to them, hear and understand, it's not what that goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. And he went on to say, do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the what? The heart. And this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. As the old timers used to put it, what's down in the well will come up in the bucket. It's what is in the heart that is reflected and uh, regurgitated, if you will, by the tongue, by the mouth. It is a powerful thing and it is difficult to learn how to control our words, to control our tongues. Some never do. There's an epitaph about a lady by the name of Arabella Young. It says, beneath this stone, a lump of clay lies Arabella Young who on the 24th of May began to hold her tongue. I heard about one lady who came forward in an old revival meeting and she said, pastor, I've come to lay my tongue on the altar. He said, well, I'm not sure it's gonna work. This altar is only 12 feet long right here. <laughs> James is talking about the tongue. Your goal is spiritual maturity. That's what the book of James is about. Growing in your faith and becoming more mature in Christ. That's your goal. And a true mark of Christian maturity, life maturity, is how you use your mouth, how you manage your mouth, how you use your tongue. So let's begin reading in chapter three, verse one. Not uh, many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Always gives me pause when I read that because I know I'm highly accountable to God for what I say and what I do. Verse two says, for we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, meaning a mature man. Also able to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also is the tongue, a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire, watch these words, course of life, wheel of existence, literally, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea and creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is restless, it is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield 
fresh water. Now, James is a master illustrator. And in this passage on the tongue, he gives us some metaphors regarding our mouths. Uh, There are uh, six of them. He talks about the bit in the mouth of a horse. He talks about uh, the rudder on a ship. He talks about a fire, a spark that can set uh, ablaze. He talks about a beast, that the tongue is like a beast or like a monster in the mouth. It's like poison. It can produce poison. He said, it's like a fountain and it is like a fig tree. And with all of these illustrative comments, very practical, James, ever practical, tells us about the tongue and what it can do and how it sets the course and even the character and the destiny of our lives. A couple of things. One, our words give us direction. That's the first thing. Our words, what we say, give us direction in life. That's why he uses the illustration about the horse and the bridle. It's amazing. You could take a 1,200 pound uh, animal and put a 90 pound child on it, but with reins and a bit, a small child can control that great horse. Same is true of the rudder on a ship. No matter how big the ship is, it is moved by the pilot at the direction of the rudder. So he's saying here that our tongue controls the direction of our lives. Change the way you speak, change what you say and how you talk, and you can change the direction of your life. It's true. I'm going to say it again. Change the way you speak, how you use your tongue, and it will change the course, the direction of your life. Proverbs tells us in Proverbs 8, 21, that life and death are in the power of the tongue. A very powerful thing is the tongue. And if you speak negatively, if you're constantly reflecting negativity in what you say, then ultimately you will live a negative life. It's a simple principle, really. How you... talk to God, how you talk to yourself, how you talk to others dramatically influences the course of your life. And if you are filled with with words that are worthless or careless or empty or even profane, then ultimately that's that's the way your life's going to turn out. let Let me just share a couple of ideas. I mean, for example, Words are powerful. They can change your life. You go to an altar and you say, I do, and I promise you that changes your life. If if someone stands before a judge and says, the judge says, you're not guilty, that changes everything. If you're before a doctor and you hear your doctor say, you're cancer free. Those words are life changing. If uh, if you say no to a temptation when when you're just under attack and and and, and you, you just can feel the breath of Satan on your neck, you know, and you say no in the power of God's Spirit to temptation, that can change the course and the direction of your life, right? When you say, yes, I will follow Jesus Christ, that not only changes your direction, it changes the destiny, your eternal future. Your words matter. Words can change history and have. If if words are demonized out of the mouth of a Hitler, then war and disaster comes. But Words that come out of the mouth of a great evangelist like Billy Graham can can change history as well. Words are powerful. If you speak words of faith, then your life is filled with faith. If you speak God's word, God's promises, God's will upon your life, it changes everything for the good. And the reverse is true. Training your tongue and tempering your tongue uh, is difficult. In fact, James tells us here, no one can control it. There's a beast, it's a beast in your mouth. That's another illustration. He says you can't contain or control this beast. Some have tried, even by taking vows of silence, 
I heard about a young man who decided he was going to go to a monastery and take a, a vow of silence to try to control his tongue. And so he was told, you do, you do not speak for three years, except you get at the end of each year two words. So the young man made it through the first year. And when he appeared before the Monsignor, he was asked, you have anything to say? And he said simply, bed hard. So he went back and spent the next year in silence. Didn't say a word. Came back the end of the second year. The Monsignor said, okay, you got two words. He said, food cold. Went back, spent the third year in silence. Didn't say a word. He had two more words to say at the end of the third year. He said, what do you have to say? He said, I quit. <laughs> to which the Monsignor said, doesn't surprise me at all. All you've done is complain ever since you've been here. No, it's impossible to control our tongues apart from the work of God's Spirit in our lives. And yet it's important. This is not a small deal. It's a big deal. Colossians 3 verse 17 is a scripture you should note. It says, for whatever you do in word and deed, do it, do everything, everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ with gratitude in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. When we put Christ first in our lives, we put Him first in the what we do and what we say. And we are able, according to this, we shouldn't speak or say anything or write anything or post anything, or send anything, which we could not sign the name of the Lord Jesus. If you cannot glorify God and magnify God with your words, then don't say them. Don't, you need to ask in every situation, if you, if you post it, if you, if you send it, if you say it, Social media is a whole new world of being able to express ourselves, but as Christians and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, I should always ask myself, does this represent Jesus Christ and reflect His love in my life? Growing Christians learn how to control their tongues under the guidance of the Holy Spirit because it sets the course of our lives. Secondly, our words can bring destruction. Not only do they bring direction, but our words can bring destruction. So James illustrates with a spark and a fire. And just a small spark. We've all had spirit experiences with matches and fire and just, just a small spark can, can in, destroy a house or destroy a, an entire forest. James says the tongue, I noted in stuff when I read it, sets on fire the course of nature, the very wheel of existence. In other words, all of life our effect is affected by our words and all the people in our lives. James says here that the tongue can be set on fire of hell. The word is Gehenna. Gehenna was the garbage dump outside of Jerusalem, burning constantly, smelling, sulfuric, it was, it was disgusting. Jesus described hell as the eternal garbage dump, burning with fire. It's the rubbish heap of the universe. He said the tongue can reflect garbage, regurgitate filth. James tells us an evil tongue defiles and destroys the entire body. A tongue set on fire of hell. Say, you ever heard that in conversation? Somebody says to somebody else, okay, give them hell. Give them hell. That's what he's talking about here. And the tongue can start a hell fire that can never be put out in a person's life. When you think about the words we use on, on the on the negative side, let's start there. We'll flip, we'll flip it in just a second. But he, here are the kinds of words that can start a fire that you can't control. Let's start with careless words. 
You ever been run over by a hit and run mouth? <laughs> Careless words. Meaningless words, vain words. You know, some people, they don't use vile words. They just use vain words. And Jesus said, we'll give an account at the judgment seat of Christ for every vain, idle word that we speak. Scary. Careless words can destroy lives in a matter of minutes. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Not true. Words can hurt and they can, they can hurt a lot. A sports writer for the Atlanta Constitution several years ago wrote these words about the tongue. He said, I am more deadly than the screaming shell from the howitzer. I win without killing. I tear down homes and break hearts and wreck lives. I travel on the wings of the wind. No innocence is strong enough to intimidate me. No purity pure enough to daunt me. I have no regard for truth, no respect for just justice, no mercy for the defenseless. My victims are as numerous as the sands of the sea and often as innocent. I never forget and seldom forgive. My name is gossip. Just idle words that can become very hurtful words. I wonder how many careless, thoughtless words have ruined relationships and fractured families and torn churches apart and destroyed reputations. Careless words, words without thinking. We should always ask the Holy Spirit to help us think before we speak. That we would think before we send. Then there are contemptuous words. Angry, hostile words. Someone said, make your words sweet because someday you may have to eat them. I wonder how many wives have been beaten down by the words, the verbal abuse of an angry husband. How many children have been wounded for life by the hostile words, the angry words of parents who don't pay attention. They're like weapons that can break down spirits, criticism, and destructive language. Words that wound. You have to live with the consequences of what you say, and often people around you live with the consequences of what we say. Contemptuous words, hateful, angry, censorous. That's the next kind of word, censorous words. Negative, critical, caustic, slanderous, backstabbing, backbiting. And James, who is our brother here, says, brothers and sisters, this should not be true about us. If we open our mouths and say, ah, and the great physician looks down, what does he see? And what's coming out of our hearts? Say, well, I don't gossip, but you know, people just tell me stuff. Don't let somebody use your ears for garbage cans. Don't participate in gossip or slander, in censorous words, and then carnal words, fleshly words, filthy words, profane words. He speaks of both blessing and cursing in this passage. Blaspheming God and blaspheming others. Filthy words, potty mouth, porno words. Immoral words that come out of the heart. Did you know that all of the Ten Commandments can be broken by our words, not just our deeds? That's why we can, we can pretty much know that we've broken all the commandments, at least by our words, if not our deeds. Uh, we, we can dishonor God by our words. We can, we can exhibit false worship and idol worship with our, our words. We can, we can offer murderous accusations and assassinations with our words. We can, we can tell lies and bear false witness with our words. We can, we can covet with our words. We can express vile and lustful thoughts, adulterous thoughts with our words. We can steal a person's reputation with our words. Words matter. 
So it's true when James says, this can set off a course of events, a fire in your life that can destroy everything. He talks then about this monster, a beast. He said, we can tame the animals. You just, so James takes us on a trip to the zoo. He said, you can tame animals, but this beast uncontrolled in your mouth, this monster in your mouth is, is restless and is powerful and is poisonous and a few drops can kill. But that brings me to the final word here, which says our words then display our character. That's what he's talking about when he says out of one side of our mouth comes blessing and the other side of our mouth comes blasting or cursing. As the Indian used to say, speaking with forked tongue, two-tongued. You ever been two-timed or two-tongued? Blessing and cursing. Someone said that the profanity of the church is greater than the profanity of the streets. And what that means is, you know, we come to church, we, you know, hey brother, how you doing? Let's praise God together. And then in the parking lot, the same guy cuts you off. You jerk! What's wrong with you? Or we go home and before we even get home, we're in an, uh, a rancorous argument with someone in the family. It ha happens all the time because our, our tongues cause us a great deal of trouble. One minute we're praising God, the next minute we're profaning people that God made. That's what he's saying here. G great people in the Bible had trouble with their tongues. Job, who overcame such disaster in his life, said, I, I am vile, I lay a hand over my mouth, like that. Isaiah, the, the great prophet, when he saw the Lord high and lifted up, he said, uh, I am a man of unclean lips amidst a generation of people of unclean lips. That's descriptive of our generation. There's just so much filth in the air. There's just so much vileness in vocabularies. And both men and women are spewing out this filth. Words. Sending out poisonous words. Moses was angry one day and he it really, he ended up out of the promised land because of it. And it says in Psalm 106, verse 33, that because he was angry, he said, I spoke rashly with my lips. How many times have we spoke, spoken rashly? We, we wish we could get it back, but of course it's like slitting open a feather pillow and the wind blowing the feathers everywhere. You can never get some of that stuff back in the pillow. Peter sinned against Christ and denying Christ and with the same mouth he confessed him and said, I will never deny you. And yet when he was warming his hands by the fires of the Romans, he ended up running away, denying Christ. It's disturbing, isn't it? When I look at my own life and I see in my words both blessing and cursing, it's, it's disturbing. James uses these words, to, uh, 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 these illustrations of a fountain, whether it's sweet water or salt water, or whether it's a fig tree, this, these illustrations of nature by saying, what is at the root will bear the same fruit. And so, the problem is with the heart. The person with a harsh tongue has an angry heart. The person with a negative tongue has an anxious heart. The person with an overactive tongue has an unsettled heart. The person with a filthy heart or a filthy tongue has an impure heart. A person with a critical censorous tongue has a bitter heart and so on. But let's flip that on the other side. A person with compassionate words has a loving heart. A person with uh, an encouraging tongue has a happy heart. A person with a truthful tongue has an honest heart. I enjoy watching the ESPN 30 for 30 presentations, video presentations, and I was watching the one on Coach uh, McCartney, Bill McCartney, formerly of the University of Colorado, national championship team, 
He was also the founder of the Promise Keepers movement. It's a powerful story called The Gospel According to McCartney, I believe. But in, in it, he said something that I stopped it, paused it several times so I could write it down. But here's what Coach McCartney said. The measure of a man is his words. Are they true? Can he back them up? In the final analysis, McCartney says, what else do we offer people? Can you back up your words? Do you live them out? Our words come from our hearts. And the only way to tame the tongue is first of all, to get a new heart. The Bible talks about getting a brand new heart because the old heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. And the only way to transform our tongues is not reformation or even education. You can improve your voc vocabulary with education. You can improve maybe your attitude with reformation. But you can only change your tongue and your actions and your words and your deeds with transformation. We need a new life. And this is how Jesus Christ changes our hearts and changes our lives. I can tell you I've seen it over the years many, many times. How a man or a woman whose tongue was off the charts, but then transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. Then ask the Holy Spirit to control your tongue. Give God control of your tongue. James says we can't do this on our own. We need the supernatural power of God. The psalmist said it this way in Psalm 141 verse 3. Set a guard over my mouth. O Lord, keep a watch over the doors of my lip. Set a guard on my mouth. Lord, watch my mouth. Or pray the prayer of the psalmist in Psalm 19 and verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. God watches our words and looks into our heart. And then use your tongue to the glory of God. Use your tongue for God's glory. The best way I know how to transform the tongue by the power of Christ is to use my tongue and my words to magnify Christ in praise and in worship. The psalmist said, thy loving kindness is better than life. My lips will praise you. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. The scripture says that we're to bring to God the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips. I don't know why we seem to be so reluctant to use our words to worship what we say or what we sing. I was watching both some basketball, some Mavs last night and also some Alabama football. And over there in Alabama, they had about 100,000 people screaming in those stands, roll tide. And they were rolling last night, sorry LSU. But it was scary, it was so loud. And you go to a ball game, you cheer, you shout, you stomp, you raise your hands, you slap in high fives. Nobody thinks a thing about it. You call that person a fan. But you come to church and if somebody, you know, lifts a hand or shouts to the Lord or praises God or sings something, that person's a fanatic. Praise God. With your words, with your worship to him. Remember, worship flows out of the heart. And it's possible, it's possible that you don't worship with your lips because you don't have it in your heart to do it. I'm not saying tip the cup, but if it spills over, <laughs> shout to the Lord. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. I wish God would give me a thousand tongues and a thousand lifetimes to speak of the wonders of his love and the power of his grace in our lives. That's how we're to use our tongues.
Our words is our witness. Our tongue is a testimony. How you do it? How's the testimony of your words? The testimony of your worship? How's your life going? Is it negative and downhill going in the wrong direction and your words are just destructive, self-destructive, or are your words powerful and persuasive? Jo- Joshua 1.8 says that we are to keep God's word in our mouths at all times. Speak the word of God over your life. Speak God's promises over your situation. Express God's praise no matter what. And your words, your tongue will be transformed to the glory of Jesus Christ. The most important thing you can say with your tongue are four words. If I only had four words to say to the world, these would be my four words. Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord.